Hey, everybody, welcome to Crackpot, the podcast for each and every week. We dive into a different conspiracy theory and discuss the merits or the demerits of each. We're your hosts. I'm Tim. And I'm Zach. <laughs> wow. A dramatic pause. I was thinking about it for a sec. Have to remember which one you are. <laughs> I'm kind of like rearranging my stuff over here. I see that. I see that. And I'm thinking about the optimal placement of notes, coffee, and water. Yeah. Yeah. You good? You ready? I think so. Locked and loaded? I don't often drink coffee when we do this. Okay. I don't ever drink coffee when we do this. You don't ever drink coffee. <laughs> it's my first cup ever. <laughs> wow. <laughs> yeah. Okay. That's I see cool. what they're talking about now. I get it. Oh, brown hot water. <laughs> Wonderful. <laughs> it tastes so good. Uh, yeah, dude. So we are uh, getting ready to rock here. Mm-hmm. Oh, 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 I get it. I get it. That actually just like happened. <laughs> it's just how uh, how finely tuned your brain is. You just come up with puns without even realizing it. <laughs> it's like when they you know they talk to musicians and they ask you know where does your inspiration come from? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And it's usually like hey when you just keep doing it like you channel something else, yeah. perhaps a higher power. I don't know. <laughs> um, uh huh. That's what I'm trying to say. The talent is stacked upon itself. <laughs> is that it? Some of us just can't help it, you know, mm-hmm, just the way mm-hmm. we're born. So that's great, man. Anyways, yeah, we are going to be rolling away s- soon with a. Uh, I don't get that interesting one. Interesting. <laughs> yeah, I was thinking rock and roll. Oh, got it. <laughs> got it. Uh, we're going to be not rolling anything. We're going to um, crank it up to 11. <laughs> there we go. Okay. And today, folks, we are talking about one of the few conspiracy theories, I believe, uh, mm-hmm. that probably literally every single person on this planet has at least heard of. The pyramids. <laughs> you the think, The Newport right? Tower. <laughs> I, that'd be a way better <laughs> answer. Go ships of uh, Lake Superior. Go ships of uh, Lake Erie. No, we are talking about good old-fashioned Stonehenge. Okay, nice. I was wondering if that was going to make an appearance. Bloody Stonehenge. Bloody Stonehenge. Everybody's very excited. Mm-hmm. And in fact, uh, to do this show, mm-hmm. what I really had to do was I had to go back, reread all the books. Yeah. Watch all the movies. Yeah. Good. Of Harry Potter. Nice. If you're playing along at home, you can cross off the Harry Potter spot on your bingo card. <laughs> I hope it's um, displayed prominently. It's a, it's actually the free space. <laughs> uh, anyways, yeah. So we're talking about Stonehenge or whatever. <laughs> or whatever. <laughs> this is just whatever comes to mind. Stonehenge, man. Yes, I've heard of it. Thank you for yeah. asking. Somewhere over in uh, England, I believe. Yeah. I mean, here's the deal. So this is one of those topics I have been putting off for a while because it's a massive topic. It's mm-hmm. a big topic. Big very heavy. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Uh-huh. Um, and uh, because of that, I was like, well, I want to do it justice. And also, I wasn't overly excited to do... I don't know, because it's, like, it's been around for so long and there's so many different theories. I was like... What, what do you say? Yeah. Rocks. Weird. Okay. <laughs> next. You're topic. really selling this. Why should I listen to the next hour and 42 minutes? Because there's some wild stuff out there. Okay, yeah. And some normal stuff that's actually just interesting, too. So... Um, it's it's actually a fascinating topic okay. overall. And and also like I said earlier, it's like this is one of those that like everybody has at least heard of. So yeah, yeah. that makes it I think uh, very interesting. I'm going to say I don't know a whole lot about this. I know yeah. it's generally in England. I know generally it's old. I don't know how old. And uh, I know that people don't really know why it's there or how it got there. That's right. And the other thing I would say like going into this episode is like remember that It's been around, and I'll get into all the age of this stuff and everything else. It's been around for a long time. So, therefore, it could have been several different things for several different purposes over the millennia, basically. Okay, okay. Because, I mean, it's just been there for such a long time. So, we'll talk about exactly, like, all the details here in just a sec. But anyways, um, yeah, I think uh, this will be fun one to jump into. So, located in Salisbury Plain in Wiltshire, England. Mm Mm-hmm. Two miles west of Amesbury, oh, which I'm sure it's beautiful. You've beautiful got it part now. of beautiful part of the countryside there. And if you're uh, not familiar with Amesbury, um, it's about a four and a half hour drive south and west of London. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So not too far from London. Um, 
But of course, you've got a bunch of old heavy rocks all very clearly, deliberately laid out in some sort of order. No markings on them. No written records left behind. Mm -hmm. Um, And from what we can tell, they were likely constructed between 2 and 3000 BCE. Wow. And they did that by carbon dating the stones? (laughs) I was going to say, how do they know? (laughs) Well, they didn't carbon date the stone because you can't do that to a rock, my friends. But uh, what they could do was look at the site, you know, some of the uh, organic matter around it, bones. Bones. Yeah. Some of the old, you know, if you dig down deep enough. Yeah. In fact, even holding up some of the rocks in place are some like bones and human fragments. So they're able to place it back about that far. And it's been like slightly added onto a little bit over the years, but by and large, you know, what you see today in the pictures in your, your mind's eye, uh, that whole thing has been around for what, 5,000 years. Right. Wow. Mm -hmm. It's kind of old. Somebody five, 5,000 plus years ago had a vision to do this. Yeah. That's kind of weird to think about. It is. I wouldn't have a vision to do that now, <laughs> let alone 5,000 years ago. Good thing you're not an architect. <laughs> I'm thinking about getting into architecture, though. Okay, okay, good. <laughs> so anyways, um, that is generally what we're talking about. And what it is, is it's a it's a rock formation. And if you haven't seen it, I, I don't even know what it... T- say to you as a human being, <laughs> but wake up, <laughs> go, go look at a picture. It, it's, it's, uh, comprised of several rings here. So there's an outer, outer ring of vertical SARS and standing stones, SARS. <laughs> which is, I guess all these different types of like terms that relate to stones are how they're like laid on top of each other. Okay. So like a SARS and stone, I believe is like, if you think of a door frame, uh-huh. it'd be like the top part of a T, oh, something sure. like that. Okay. Yeah. okay. So it's like, it has all these weird terms that I'm sure our geologist friends and yes, listeners of the yeah. show are enjoying. <laughs> Anyways, it's made of uh, an outer ring of vertical SARS and standing stones. It's uh, some type of sandstone rock. Each of those are around 13 feet high. That is four meters. Seven feet wide. It's about uh, two meters wide. And of course, many of them weighing several tons. And inside is a ring of smaller blue stones. Blue stone is a type of stone. It's Not local. actually blue. And I know. It's more like um, I don't think gray. Okay, yeah. yeah. So that's cool. Um, and inside uh, those stones are freestanding trilithons, two bulkier vertical sarsens joined by one lintel. <laughs> so <laughs> I'm I'm keeping notes here <laughs> just I'm to give you a track. mental picture. Thank you. Yes, the <laughs> trilobites and the sarsen stones. Yes. <laughs> and uh, the cool thing is, yeah, like I said, you know tens of tons of stone just (laughs) laying haphazardly but with some intention they're really big they're put in place for a specific purpose at least seemingly not random and they're huge and enormous and heavy and really old so when you were a kid looking at the structure yes and you as an adult now looking Mm -hmm. at the structure like what has your head been like what thoughts did you have in terms of like questions i guess i would say yeah i would say when i was a kid it was probably something along the lines of druids Mm -hmm. and and some sort of celestial calendar Oh, sure, kind of sure. thing. Now it's very clearly alien built <laughs> for for uh, probably human sacrifice purposes. Oh, oh, so, yeah. So I, I, uh, yeah, that's where my head's at now. Well, that's interesting um, because, well, clearly you haven't done your research. But also, I was going to say, like, <laughs> what, uh, what, what other things came to mind in terms of like questions? Because to me, for example, I'll, I'll just say this much. I could not figure out for the life of me how on earth you would get like yeah. these stones hoisted on top of one yes. another. Yes. Oh, I mean completely. Like how they actually did it. I mean that's I haven't done the research. I haven't looked into this too much, but I mean that's the big question. It's like you know, now you would just use like a crane or a backhoe or some large yeah. piece of machinery and do it, but it's like I don't know, like how do you even do it? Like when I see the the pictures 
of this, it's not like there's trees nearby. I mean, not that they couldn't oh, sure. bring trees to hoist up some sort of pulley mechanism to, to bring these things up. But I mean, these are enormous stones. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So how do you do it? Well, I'll, I'll talk about some of the uh, construction methods later. But like, you know, if you think about the pyramids and such, it's like it's maybe not outside the possibility that we could sure. as humans do this kind but of I thing. But I mean, like pyramids, it's like probably a ramp, you know, yeah. well, this I'll, is like the same thing for Stonehenge. It's the exact same thing. <laughs> okay, just cut me off. Yeah, because... It doesn't even matter. And if you think about it, though, it's, it's very logical because you can just roll things mm -hmm, up. Mm -hmm. and, and if you think about a ramp also to get the stones on top of, what, the 12-foot high other rocks? Yeah. You know, if you build a ramp long enough, yeah. it, there's virtually... You, you can make it so there's virtually no incline. Sure. Um, then where's the ramp? <laughs> where's the ramp now, buddy? Now you're asking the right questions. Yeah. So thank you for that. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so since I spoiled something later, but it doesn't matter. That wasn't like a big reveal. Uh, anyways, so let's get into uh, some conventional theories here around maybe who built the site. Mm -hmm. Because I would say if you're not going to just assume it was aliens mm -hmm. or something else, you mm -hmm. should say, hey, wait, what of what are like the modern scientists say? Yeah. My least favorite kind of theories. <laughs> yeah, exactly, dude. Uh, so if you're going to believe them, mm -hmm. uh, researchers studying DNA extracted from Neolithic human remains across Britain determined that the ancestors of the people who built Stonehenge were farmers who came from the Eastern Mediterranean. Really? Which I didn't. I don't know. That blows my mind. Why are they doing that? Why are they traveling all, all the way across Europe and then across the strait? Yeah. And then building giant things. What's their motives? What's going on? Well, it, it's, don't think of it as they just came across to build this thing. Uh -huh. This was like the migration of humans. <laughs> no, I can't. Okay. Right, right. <laughs> Which is also like, that's actually yeah. shocking to yeah. me. Yeah, no, that is that is some fascinating stuff. Um, And that the DNA studies that they've done of those remains have indicated that uh, those people were predominantly Asian uh, ancestry, Asian, I can never say that word, uh, although their agricultural techniques seem to have come originally from Antolia. And that's even um, a little bit further. That's like Asia Minor, basically. Oh, wow. <laughs> so like that's Turkey, yeah. kind of, wow. Yeah, it's okay. further, I guess, east at that point. Uh, so the Aegean farmers moved to Iberia, right? So like Spain, yep. uh, before heading north, reaching Britain in around 4000 BC. And these Neolithic migrants to Britain also may have introduced the tradition of building monuments using large megaliths. Stonehenge was just another example. So, as I said earlier, they didn't just show up for the purpose of building Stonehenge. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, although that could probably be a strange like conspiracy theory too. <laughs> let's go to let's go to this island and build a giant thing and then, yeah, yeah, set but, up some farms. <laughs> you know, it's like this migration of humans then brought with them the building techniques and okay. also this tradition of making okay. these you know megaliths or whatever. Okay. So that's pretty cool. Um, but what I find funny is that because it has been around for so stinking long, there have been many different theories over the years around maybe who built it or why and all yeah, this kind of stuff. Yeah. And so I was like, I was just thinking about this. You know, imagine um, you're just in like medieval Britain and it's like, what's with this pile of stones? <laughs> right. I mean, the, the interesting thing, I mean, not to like belabor the point, but Stonehenge to me, it's it it's not only who built it, it's when it's how, and it's why. It's all of those things. That's right. That's right. So you're basically telling me the who. So, and not not Peter Townsend. And <laughs> I think they took a picture by it. Didn't okay. They? <laughs> no, that's that was in Leeds, I think. <laughs> but good good callback. Yeah. Um. Anyways, okay. So you know, back think about this. Back in the 12th century, uh, there was a book written uh, called "The History of the Kings of Britain." It's actually like in a Latin name, yeah, but yeah. I'm not going to bother with that. And, <laughs> and it claimed that Stonehenge was brought from Ireland with the help of the wizard Merlin. That makes sense to me. <laughs> I just like, I can't imagine, you know, if you're just like a, a, a serf in yeah. medieval like Britain or what yeah. is England, I guess I would say. Yeah. And your kid's like, hey, dad, who built Stonehenge or how was it built? Well, that, that magician just like conjured it up here from ireland oh yeah. okay cool all right see you later <laughs> skateboards away 
<laughs> Beautiful. Okay, so we have a wizard theory. I love it. <laughs> so, yeah, I got to break this one down because it's actually pretty cool, this uh, Merlin theory, uh, before we go much further. Um, so, basically, uh, according to that uh, book that I referenced earlier here, uh, stones of Stonehenge were considered healing stones, hmm. which uh, giants had brought from Africa to Ireland. They had been raised on Mount Kiliarus uh, to form a stone circle known as the Giant's Ring or the Giant's Round. And the 5th century King Aurelius Ambrosius, I guess, <laughs> shout out to listener Aurelius, uh, <laughs> wished to build a great memorial to the British Celtic nobles slain by the Saxons at Salisbury. Okay. Uh, so Merlin advised him to use the Giant's Ring. And the king sent for Merlin and... <laughs> Arthur Pendragon, yeah. King Arthur's father, yeah, yeah, <laughs> with 15,000 men to bring it from Ireland. And they defeated an Irish army led by Gilmanius, but mm-hmm. were unable mm-hmm. to move the huge stones. Enter Merlin. Yeah, <laughs> they yep, transported yep. the stones to Britain and re-erected them as they had said previously in Ireland. That's um, wild. That's wild. So from Africa, the Giants brought it. Yeah, to Ireland. And then Merlin took it back from Ireland. Yeah. Okay. I like that theory. That's, a, <laughs> that's a number one on my list right now. So anyways, the uh, according to an archaeologist, Mike Parker Pearson, he suggests ac- actually this story may hold a grain of truth, however. <laughs> Which part? Uh, he said that the Stonehenge blue stones were were brought from the Juan Mon stone, stone Circle on the sea, Irish Sea coast of Wales. But, I mean, I don't know. That doesn't sound like conclusive proof to me. He, that's well, what he, he says. says so. Yeah. Uh, we'll talk about maybe some other scientists' <laughs> opinions here okay. shortly. But any, anyways. Any, anyone else say anything about Africa? Uh, not directly, though. No. Okay. No. Okay. And uh, there's a reason for that, though. And, uh, yeah, we'll talk about that. But anyways, um, let's talk about some modern accepted theories for you know why they were being built uh my second least favorite modern accepted yeah so i'll say that basically as i mentioned earlier all of these could be true they don't necessarily have to be uh mutually exclusive and so um some of the thoughts are that this could be a place of worship this could be some sort of astrological observatory yep yep um and i think that most of the theories today fall into one of those two categories okay okay basically you know what um they're arranged in such a way that yeah uh, on the on the solstice you do see the sun align with like the main stone so that seems kind of obvious that right? makes sense and yeah. also it's like you know, these stones do look like they are arranged almost as if they're altars, right? So you could just, like, logically speaking, basically every conventional theory yeah. radiates off of those two different okay. points. Okay. A couple of other thoughts, though, to kind of like break some of this stuff up a little bit further is there's this uh, Dr. Gerald Hawkins. He's a British, uh, now living in the U.S., um, professor. And he's teaching at Boston University. He theorized that the it was an astronomical observatory to track the movement of the planets and sun over a 56-year cycle. Mm-hmm. And that's Stephen Hawking said that? <laughs> His brother. <laughs> His brother. Gerald. Gerald. Ger- Jerry Hawkins. He does all the French stuff. <laughs> uh, 56-year cycle. That's interesting. That's a seemingly random number. I know. I, I, so with the, I, like, I didn't buy his book and read oh. <laughs> or attend his lectures at Boston University. So I was like, why 56? I guess maybe there could be some significance to that unless it's like, well, it's just a coincidence. Maybe it's some sort of planetary uh, yeah, something. That's the, Let's go with that. It's like the... One, the, the amount of time it takes Pluto to go around the sun one time or something, you know? Not even close. Yeah, it's let's like 32,000. <laughs> yeah, right. Anyways, uh, so that was one theory. Another theory uh, put forth by a gentleman named Mike Parker Pearson uh, of Sheffield University. He believed it was part of a ritual landscape. So he said that there's a, uh, a town near Stonehenge called Durrington Wells. And uh, that was a place or a symbol of the place of the living. Okay. Whereas Stonehenge was actually a place of the dead. Oh. A journey along the Avon to reach Stonehenge from Darrington was a ritual passage from life to death. And it celebrates ancestors. So that leads me to believe that there would be some sort of mass burial grounds nearby. 
or mm. within it, yeah. right? They, you know what's funny is they've found a number of uh, skeleton remains, skeletal remains. They've found stuff that would suggest people have died there. But it's not like it's the overwhelming majority. It's not like they've found 3,000 skeletons. Yeah, no, no, yeah, no. yeah, it's, yeah. It's, it's yeah. like, from what I can understand here, uh, here and there. So it's really just like, I don't know, maybe maybe it's for the dead. Yeah, well, like, it's it's this symbolism. And he was saying, okay, perhaps there was an ancient tradition where you started in Durrington and then almost like a funeral procession yeah. or something followed yeah. the Avon River to Stonehenge, and that's where it was. Okay. I don't know. That's fine. Uh, that theory, not that it presupposes, but it doesn't even begin to explain, like, how it was built. <laughs> So no, that's true. That's like, true. Okay, well, it's here, and maybe it's for some sort of uh, yeah afterlife ceremony. Yeah. Well, and the thing is, too, they don't really have any evidence for anything. I mean, that's the whole problem. So there's no carvings or etchings on these actual stones. <laughs> and the people that I described earlier that were living there at the time left no written records of anything. Yeah, yeah. And so probably starting like a thousand years after it was built, which was at this point now 4,000 years ago, they didn't even have a clue. <laughs> that is so wild. <laughs> if you think about it. <laughs> that is so old. Yeah. yeah. So anyways, um, all right. So those are like kind of some variations on some pretty common themes okay. for, you know, Yeah, I mean, reasons. honestly, they all seem somewhat plausible. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now, here's something that I was surprised by. So um, to get into the fact of like, how did they build it? Mm -hmm. th they actually only recently have been able to conclusively prove where these stones were from. There we go. Okay. Like in the last, I think it was like 2018. Yeah. Some sort of core drilling yeah. sample they could, you know, test they could perform. And they actually uh, were able to, I guess... DNA sequence, right? <laughs> right. It's a geological DNA, I believe yeah. it's called. Yeah, <laughs> Just, that's right. Uh, analyze uh, the mineral samples or whatever from these stones, and they found that the uh, majority of the blue stones and such came from about 15 miles away. How many British miles is that? 15. <laughs> um, that's a long ways, and I, I know, I know, it's like a heck of a lot closer than Africa, but. And also not Ireland, <laughs> but yeah, still, yeah, yeah. like fifteen miles, man. Like that's a that's a trek. See, I'm so disappointed in that fact. I'm th like this. This ruins my day. Oh, how so? This literally makes me angry. Okay, you look angry <laughs> because I wanted this to be one of those things where it's like, oh yeah, we discovered these stones and like. I don't know. Yeah. Norway. South, of, South America. <laughs> yeah, please, something. Give me, you know, Lake Superior stones. <laughs> yeah, right. I'd be like, okay, that's tight. So some sort of quarry or something. So are these, uh, they have to be carved, chiseled, right? I mean, they're not like they found these stones in the exact same shape, right? Yeah, but there aren't conclusive, like, you know, there there's some cutting marks in the stones, but they aren't necessarily clearly like chiseled sure. so yeah i mean it's like they must have just taken some of the big old stones that looked like they could kind of hoist them up and then just moved them just put them on their backs and walk 15 miles yeah and they did like so i will say the conventional theory for how this was built was just cutting down trees in yeah. the area and rolling them rolling pins yeah just going going on top of those yeah i mean that makes the most sense but give me something better man <laughs> <laughs> well and like i said earlier in terms of just you know, what makes the most sense, like this technology existed at the time, of course. And like I said, to get those heavy stones up so high, it you just extend the ramp and you can go very incrementally, you know, higher over a much sure. larger amount of space. So there's not a river. They didn't put them on large <laughs> boats and float Correct. them down. Correct. Okay. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Maybe they had some like oxen or domesticated uh, large animal pull them potentially. Mm -hmm. I'm still going to say 15 miles is a long way. Why not just build it right by the quarry? Well, I wonder if it's because if you think about uh, the solstice, like the calendar idea, mm -hmm. perhaps there wasn't a clear shot. Like maybe sure. that quarry would have been a little bit too low. Or yeah, like yeah, that. yeah, yeah, yeah. So it definitely shows that this was put in a specific place with mm -hmm. a specific purpose. Exactly. So anyways, that's, that is if you believe them, as I said. Uh, so let's talk about some 
Well, I hate to call it fringed because to me this is mainstream. But I thank you. Yes. Let's talk about some fringe theories about the purpose and perhaps why or how they were built. My favorite kind of theory. According to archaeologist Gregory Wainwright and Timothy Darville, they reported in 2008 that a large number of skeletons removed from around Stonehenge showed signs of illness or injury. So they were putting forth this theory that perhaps Stonehenge was a place for healing. Okay. Uh, They took it a step further, and this one actually is insane to me. So they found uh, remains of individuals. One in particular, a teenage boy buried approximately 1550 BC who was actually raised near the Mediterranean Sea. Oh, Oh, interesting. Like, how? How do they know that? Yeah. All of a sudden, (laughs) way more questions. How did he get there? Oh, man. It was just like the the Mayo Clinic of... uh... Of the British Isles. Dude, that's exactly right. <laughs> uh, they they somehow uh, f- found this uh, metal worker from 2300 BC. They dubbed him the Amesbury Archer. He grew up near the Alpine foothills of Germany. What? <laughs> okay. Whoa. He just comes on over. Okay. And the Boscombe Bowman uh, arrived likely from Brittany, France. So... It's weird to think that like people were either brought there or going there from far off places. And why would you do that? Well, probably, especially as they're finding markings or signs of injury on some of these skeletons, like perhaps they were going there to be healed. Yeah. And that's also because, uh, and I, I'd never heard this before, but, but apparently these blue stones, like historically humans have looked to those as like healing stones okay sure 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 so if they were able to kind of go there and touch the stones or perhaps you know maybe take a little piece of a stone as a talisman something like that once every 56 years (laughs) well what's interesting about that is people coming from the mediterranean and the germanic regions and all that stuff very specifically for a purpose whatever that purpose might be but there's no record anywhere in continental europe of what this is it seems to me like if it's that famous i guess if that's the right word like someone somewhere would have a record like oh yeah and when xyz (laughs) happens we go to stonehenge (laughs) for this reason that's a really great point that's one of the smartest things you've ever said oh thank you i appreciate that yeah i mean low bar but (laughs) thanks buddy but no seriously you're right it's like yeah you would assume uh there must be some record somewhere in germany um or the pyramids i don't know you're (laughs) right (laughs) we go to stonehenge (laughs) that's where we're going right now man so that's pretty wild to me okay um and i guess i would say like all right i mean that could be true it could Mm -hmm. make sense Mm -hmm. almost Mm -hmm. like a, a giant hospital uh, another theory put forward by uh, researchers, uh, specifically this guy named Stephen Waller, who's, get this, a researcher of archaeoacoustics. That is my new dream job. Oh, my God, that is awesome. <laughs> um, he said that Stonehenge may have been a place of worship similar to a cathedral or a concert hall, and that's because of the incredibly peculiar acoustics. Within it? Yeah. I mean, it's in the middle of a field. What's going on? Yeah, so listen to this. He said if you stand in the right spot and have two pipers Uh or musicians (laughs) playing, right, the reverberation of the sound can cancel each other out depending depending on where you're standing. That's amazing. Which is pretty cool. That's awesome. And he actually, uh, this is pretty cool too, he backed up this theory at the annual meeting of the American Association for the Advancement of Science back in 2012, where he claimed that uh, this, uh, he cited stories about stones around Stonehenge often being referred to as piper stones in legends and folklore around uh, England. So I was going to say that seems potentially like a happy coincidence, Mm. but... Right. If they're referred to as Piper Stones far enough back, it's like, well, that's an odd name without knowing too much about ge- geology. So yeah. maybe there's something to that. That to me would make a lot of sense, right? Huh. Um, but yeah, who, yeah, which is named after which or whatever yeah. the case may be. Yeah, okay. 
Okay. So that made a lot of sense to me. Um, another one, and this is like the most misleading headline of all time, but it's called, uh, the, the theory is that it was a giant team building exercise. <laughs> After they did the the rope course, yeah. they built giant, you know, 15 ton rocks on top of each other. You have to trust fall off the oh top of Stonehenge. God. Like it's a corporate retreat. No. What what even is that? Well, yeah, that's what I said too. And I looked into it and actually it makes more sense to what I thought, but it's just a stupid label. So uh, according to the University College London's uh, Professor Pearson, the beginning of the site's construction coincides with the time of increased unity among the Neolithic people of Britain. So I suppose they probably went back and figured out, okay, these were like the warring periods or whatever sure, else. Sure, sure, yeah. Um, and he was saying that perhaps uh, they were inspired by the natural flow of the landscape, which seemed to connect the summer solstice sunrise at the winter solstice sunset. He said perhaps this was essentially a monument to the unity of these people. So they were building like the British version of the Statue of Liberty. Okay, okay, sure. And he was saying that, you know, and I'm quoting here, just the work itself, requiring everything, literally to pull together, would have been an act of unification. Yeah. Okay. So. I guess. Yeah. It's random. I mm-hmm. don't know. I don't know about that. Yeah. Uh, but, of course, we can't talk about ancient structures. We can't talk about yes. mysterious structures. Yes. yes. Without bringing in, oh, I don't know, aliens. Thank you. Now, this is why I tuned in. (laughs) Well, guess who, not probably first theorized, but guess who theorized heavily about Oh, I don't know. Eric Von Donegan? (laughs) Yeah. I guess he, uh, yeah, he wanted to make some more money. But no, but like one of the central theories to, you know, the chariots of the gods Mm -hmm. is that uh, these old ancient structures, these stones could not have possibly been put there by humans. They're too heavy. Too big. Exactly. They were too primitive. Yeah. And why would you, like, really, why would you actually do this anyways? <laughs> Thank you. And Finally, so, <laughs> someone speaking my language. Yeah, exactly. So he was saying that uh, probably the fact that these are big, heavy stones, they're mm-hmm. all shaped, or I'm sorry, they're all stood up in such a shape that would suggest... It could be some sort of communication with lookers from above. Okay, okay. Um, he was saying that maybe this is a alien landing pad. Oh, brilliant. Like a craft landing pad. Sure. Uh, that could be one theory. Another one could be it's an ancient uh, satellite dish oh. to communicate with aliens. Say more about that. <laughs> I think you just did. It's an ancient <laughs> satellite dish. Uh and I, I mean, basically, I'm almost tired of that angle for this specific, you know, type of genre right yeah, now. Yeah, no, it's it's goofy. I mean, I'm not saying it's like a zero because, eh, you know, whatever, who knows? But it to me, it's like if they were, if they, meaning the aliens, were doing something like this, I would imagine it would be like um, laid out much differently maybe like some prime numbers maybe yeah. some sort of uh knowledge or or uh something that they couldn't do i mean because as as you basically said like the act of doing it probably while very difficult and time consuming is not impossible yeah that's right that's right like if we saw a modern manhattan day sky rise yeah that's what i'm saying that was six thousand years old i'd be like no that's okay make it out of steel you know yeah (laughs) make it like the periodic table of elements or something (laughs) like that and i also think like if you're aliens and you're gonna visit here and construct something like yeah, make it something useful or like leave a supercomputer. Yay, thank you. Yeah, some circuitry, yes. some something. Not just these old stones lying old, around. Old stones kind of haphazardly uh, laying on top of each other, right? That's right. That's right. So, but I, I will say this much though. Now, it depends on whether you're talking about, let's just say, some recency bias, or you're trying to kind of somehow confirm something that you believe in your gut when in fact maybe it's just a coincidence. There have been uh, more 
UFO incidents around Stonehenge. No, so really? we can't just say old Eric von Doniken is off his rocker, even though I'm assure you he is. <laughs> he is, yes. <laughs> um, a police helicopter crew in Wales reported seeing a cluster of small rotating objects in the sky in June 2008. Oh, fascinating. Um, a tabloid, uh, so the Sun newspaper heralded it as <laughs> yeah. an alien army. Okay, yeah, of course. Uh, they also, the Sun also uh, told a story about a damaged wind turbine in North Lincolnshire in January 2009, claiming that a UFO hit the wind turbine. Unlikely, but okay. Uh, a woman in Dorset reported seeing a bright white fireball come through her kitchen window in August 2009. She said the fireball fell into a carrier bag and disappeared in a flash of blinding light. This is, of course, nearby. Uh, a schoolgirl in Altrincham, I think I said that right, <laughs> sent the ministry a letter in 2009 describing a set of small objects that she saw flying near uh, Stonehenge. And she sent another letter saying, please, you know, look into this. Send the Royal Air Force. Oof. Oof. Certainly not drones or anything. <laughs> right, right, right. Um, and, and like, I I had read that the official UFO reporting desk mm -hmm. of the British government mm -hmm. actually had to shut down because too many calls were coming in from folks that had seen UFOs. Over Stonehenge. Too many. We got to stop doing what we're doing. Yeah. yeah. Nothing to see here, folks. I believe it, though. I believe it. Uh, I believe that they're not, not necessarily every single one of those uh, those stories, but like, <laughs> yeah, there's probably some weird sightings over there. It would make sense, right? I mean, I guess it's like, it's a, a weird looking structure, and if aliens are curious, they'd probably come down to check it out. I would. If I were an alien. <laughs> you got to think like an alien right <laughs> think now. Think like an alien. So, okay, pivoting off of that for a second, mm -hmm. is there any... Proof or or archaeological evidence of other like wooden structures around it? No, like there were walls or anything else. Well, like that? you know what they've done is they've reconstructed, and I assume they use some sort of lasers and I don't even know mm -hmm, what else mm -hmm. uh, sonar technology to say. Okay, we we think we know what the original structure looked like because it did in fact get added onto over the years, oh, okay. and some of that organic matter, of course, would have been lost. So they have what they think is a pretty good sense of what it looked like. Although they are constantly finding stuff. Yeah, it's one of those places where they're like, oh, we found you know, you know three thousand more stones <laughs> two miles away or something i don't know huh okay because i'm thinking like maybe this is like enclosed or something maybe there was mean? a roof over it. i don't know oh i see what you're saying I maybe saying. who knows yeah well i guess that wouldn't yeah one way or the other wouldn't <laughs> probably make a huge difference but no i guess not it doesn't really answer a lot of questions but we do know that the stones came from not far away yeah we do know that it is not terribly it's not impossible to build yep uh, well, obviously. <laughs> and we, we know that it does line up with some celestial events. Yeah. Okay. So where would you say then, in thinking about all the theories, conventional, fringe, etc., where does your head land? Yeah. I mean, it seems like it was built by an ancient people for some sort of calendar or religious purpose. Yeah. Uh, slash both, I yeah. suppose. Yeah. Do you take any stock in the alien angle to this? Yeah, I really don't. Yeah, I mean, yeah. in full in full disclosure, um, it would be cooler <laughs> it would if, be so cool. if it was. Yep. Uh, but no, I just I just don't. It just doesn't. I mean, you take something like the pyramids in Egypt, and it's like those, you know, maybe one percent UFO. Yeah, because it's just so massive the and so is... confusing and so precise yeah. with so many different things. Right. Uh, this one, you know, it's just like yeah, some some big giant stones laying on top of each other in the middle of a field. It's like, <laughs> yeah, okay. I mean, I could see people doing that if they're bored, right? I mean, that's basically it. So I guess where I come down is is yeah, essentially over the course of what five thousand years, it was you know, its intent or the purpose to build this thing might have been just religious yeah let's say of course and then over the years perhaps it was used as a calendar or whatever else i don't know but i i, I would say i think for stonehenge itself although we don't know exactly what it was i think there's nothing so outside the realm of possibility that would lead me to think there's anything more than an innocuous explanation yeah, so 100 percent. it's um what what i find fascinating is that 
probably different groups of people used it for different purposes. Yep. And besides the original creators, everyone's like, I don't know, <laughs> maybe, maybe magicians. Yeah, I know. You know? It's like giants, what? giants, yeah. both. Yeah. And you got people coming from thousands of miles away That's to right. hang out there, That's you know, right. do what they got to do. That's cool. That is wild. So there you go, my friend. That is Stone Edge. Now, I will say, unlike, you know, some of the other topics that we cover, you know, we could learn something in a year or two that flips this whole thing on its head. So, yeah, yeah. Sasquatch. Mm hmm. Loch Ness Monster. Exactly. It all ties together. All right, everybody. Thank you so much for tuning in this week. Um, We love it when you listen. We love it even more when you rate, review, subscribe. And if you haven't already, check out our Patreon. Where can you find that, Zach? www.patreon.com slash crackpot podcast. We got hundreds of other episodes over there and a nice little weekly bonus show. So check that out if you got time. Rate, review, subscribe, tell your friends, tell your neighbors, tell your local dancing druids about our podcast, and we will see you next week. Thanks, everybody.